So now, to our extraordinary speaker. It's a great personal honor and pleasure to have Professor Robert P. George with us tonight. He holds Princeton's celebrated McCormick Professorship of Jurisprudence, and he's the founder and director of its James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I cannot begin to do justice to his many leadership roles in civic and political life, the numerous awards he has received, and his many publications. But if I could have the next 30 minutes with you, I'll just start listing them. Uh, so just some highlights. He has served as chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, and he served on the US Commission on Civil Rights and on the President's Council on Bioethics. He's also served as the US member on UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology. He's been a judicial fellow at the United States Supreme Court, where he received the T Justice Tom C. Clark Award. He holds a law degree and a master's of theology degree from Harvard, and four degrees from Oxford University, a DPhil, a bachelor's and a doctorate of civil law, and a DLIT degree. He's also been awarded 22 honorary doctorates. He's the recipient of, among many other awards, the US Presidential Citizens Medal, the Honorific Medal for the Defense of Human Rights of the Republic of Poland, the Canterbury Medal of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and also Princeton University's President's Award for Distinguished Teaching. In his spare time, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And I'll mention just two of his books, among many I could list, because these are particularly related, I think, to his remarks tonight. From 30 years ago, celebrating the 30th anniversary this year, Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties and Public Morality, and In Defense of Natural Law. I'll say more later in our interview about his influence in establishing and guiding our new school at Arizona State University seven years ago. So our format, Professor George will speak from the podium here for about 40 minutes, and then in part two of the evening, he'll join me on stage uh, where I'll have very aggressive, hostile questions for him. In part three, you get your opportunity. We have a microphone in the middle aisle. We have about 20 minutes for audience Q&A. We invite everybody to stay for some refreshments and further conversation at the end of the evening. So for our 2023 Constitution Day lecture, addressing the Constitution and civic virtue, please join me in welcoming Robert P. George. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Professor Carice, for that very, very kind and generous uh, introduction. I also want to express uh, my thanks to the dignitaries who came out uh, this evening and to the Jack Miller Center. Uh, the center does wonderful work all over the country, especially but not only uh, for Constitution Day at colleges and universities across the land. And gosh, do I want to congratulate and thank everybody who is responsible for creating and sustaining Arizona State University's School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. This institution is setting the example for institutions all over the country. It's setting the example for the highest possible standard in civic education. And I think one thing we probably can all agree about is our nation would benefit enormously from greater understanding among our young people, but not just among our young people, of the basic principles and institutions of our American Republican form of government. My theme, as Professor Carice uh, mentioned, is constitutional structures and civic virtues. Those of us who are citizens of democratic republics tend not to refer to those who govern us as rulers, do we? We don't speak of our rulers when we speak about President Biden or the governor or the legislators or the sheriff. It is our boast, rather, that we rule ourselves, that we're a government not only of the people, which of course all government is, and not only a government for the people, which all good government is, even the government of a benign despot, but government a government by the people, a Republican, or today the more common term is a democratic form of government, a form of government under which the people rule, the people govern themselves. 
And there is truth in this boast that we govern ourselves. We, of course, get to choose, or at least play a role in choosing, those who do govern us, those who do rule. And so we prefer to speak of governors and presidents and other elected officials not as our rulers, but as what? Servants, public servants, or at least people in public service. Uh, if we watch a politician being interviewed on television, let's say a member of the United States Senate, uh, he or she might say, well, in all of my 38 years of public service, I have never seen such an outrageous thing as what's being proposed by the other party. But that reference is to public service. I'm a public servant. Heavens, I'm not a ruler. I'm not a governor. I don't govern people. I serve them. Now, of course, these so-called servants are nothing remotely like the servants on, say, Downton Abbey, right? Did you watch Downton Abbey, Carson the butler? The extraordinary prestige and usually the trappings attaching to public office in just about all times and all places would by themselves be sufficient to distinguish, say, the mayor of Phoenix or the governor of Arizona or the president of the United States from Carson the butler. But that prestige signals an underlying fact that discomfits our democratic and egalitarian sensibilities, namely the fact that even in liberal democratic regimes, even in democratic republics like ours, high public officials are rulers. They make the rules. They enforce the rules. They resolve disputes about the meaning and applicability of the rules. We have some judges and justices in the audience with us this evening. And we don't shy away from referring to the judicial branch of government, whether state or federal, as a branch of the government, do we? To a very large extent, at the end of the day, what the people in office say goes. Now, of course, our rulers rule not by dint of sheer power, the way the mafia might do in a territory over which it happens to have gained control, but rather our rulers rule lawfully. Constitutional rules specify public offices and settle the procedures for filling those offices. So though holders of public office are indeed rulers, they are not absolute rulers. Constitutional rules set the scope and thus the limits of their jurisdiction, to use that lawyer's term, and authority. They are, in other words, rulers who are themselves subject to rules. They rule in limited ways and ordinarily for limited terms, which may or may not be indefinitely renewable at the pleasure of the voters. They rule by virtue of democratic processes by which they come to hold public office. They can be removed or significantly disempowered at the next election if the people are not happy with them. Still, despite all that, they rule. Now, my point is not to hoot at the idea of government and those holding governmental offices and controlling the levers of governmental power in our Republican democracy as servants. I'm not holding that idea up to ridicule. On the contrary, I want in the end to defend the idea that rulers can indeed be servants and ought to be. I want to establish, however, that if these people we call public servants are indeed servants, they're servants in a very special sense, a sense that is compatible with them at the same time being rulers. They are people who serve us how? By ruling. They serve us well by ruling well. A good public servant is a, a servant who rules well. If they rule badly, of course, they serve us poorly, they disserve us. Now, there are, of course, lots of ways 
that rulers at any level of public office can disserve those whom they have the moral obligation to serve by ruling well. Now, most obviously and universally, there is incompetence. Then, of course, there is corruption. And at the extreme, there is tyranny. So what does it mean for the ruler to be truly a servant? What does it mean for someone holding political office and exercising public power to rule well? Well, it means making and executing decisions for the sake of the common good, a concept, the common good, which itself requires an understanding of the human good, those goods of human nature which, as aspects of the well-being and fulfillment of us and those like us, our fellow human beings, are constitutive of our flourishing. Such decisions will necessarily be compatible with the requirements of justice, natural justice, and at the same time, they will embody justice. If we understand the concept of the common good properly, and I'll say a word about that in a moment, then we will see that no decision that violates a requirement of justice by, let's say, violating people's rights or something like that, no decision that violates a requirement of justice is truly for the common good. It may seem to be at superficial first glance, but no decision that violates a principle of justice can be for the common good, and no decision that genuinely upholds and serves the common good will fail to advance the cause of justice. Now, of course, reasonable people of goodwill can and often do disagree about what the common good requires and forbids. That is, we disagree amongst ourselves about what in truth really is just and what really is unjust. I've spent much of my uh, career, I've been in this business now, I'm entering my 39th year. It's hard for me to actually say that and acknowledge it, but uh, it seems like yesterday. But much of my career has been devoted to criticizing a kind of uh, political theory, a liberal political theory of the sort associated, some of you in your courses in political theory will recognize that this name, with the thought of the great Harvard political philosopher John Rawls. So much of my work has been an engagement and criticism of Rawls, but I have great respect for Rawls, and I have enormous respect for the fact that he addressed or attempted to address a question that is exactly the right question. And that is, what do we do about the fact that reasonable people of goodwill can and do disagree about stuff, and not just about the superficial, trivial things of life, but the deep, important questions of life. Human nature, the human good, human dignity, human rights. What do we do about that? Rawls identified what he called the fact of reasonable pluralism. And he's absolutely right about this. And that is that in circumstances of freedom, like those we treasure under our Constitution, on this Constitution day and always, in circumstances of freedom, especially freedom of conscience, especially freedom of religion, it is natural and unavoidable that people are going to arrive at different conclusions about things because there really are burdens of judgment. Stuff is hard. Figuring out what's right and wrong is not always easy. And so on some important questions, people are going to disagree. What do we do about that? Should we shoot each other about it? Should we have wars? Is there another way? Should we put a strong man into power and just trust him? Or can we do it by Republican methods, what today we would call democratic methods? Shall we argue and debate and deliberate and vote and the majority wins? Never permanently, because if we're a free people, if we're truly a democratic republic, there are no permanent losers and no permanent winners. The losers today can always come back tomorrow or next week or next year and say, hey, you know what, we got that one wrong. We need to revisit what we did and enact a new policy. And of course, even honorable people of goodwill exercising public power can commit injustices, even serious injustices, while seeking in good faith to do justice 
and believing in good faith that they are doing it. That's part of the human condition too. People of good will can do bad things thinking they're doing what's right and good. And people means all of us. So just as not all violations of the common good are injustices, not all injustices are the result of malice or ill will or like vices. Still, all injustices, even if committed by people who are sincerely trying to do the right thing, nevertheless harm the common good. For justice itself is a common good. We all, in common, have an interest in living in a just society. And it is an aspect of the common good, it being justice is an aspect of the common good of the political community. It's to the benefit of each and every citizen to live in a just social order. And harm to that order is therefore a loss for everyone and not merely for the immediate and obvious victims of any particular injustice. Indeed, it is a loss even for the ostensible beneficiaries of the injustices, and indeed, even for their perpetrators. It's actually not good for slaveholders to live in a society in which slavery is lawful and practiced. Yes, the slaves are much more the victims than the slaveholders, obviously, but everyone, including the slaveholders, are harmed. Injustice does bad, not good, even for its putative beneficiaries. Though, of course, genuine evildoers, the Hitlers and the Maos and the Pol Pots of the world, don't see it that way. Corruption of character narrows their vision of the good, blinding them to the profound respects in which wrongdoing harms what is in truth their interest in living in a just society, as well as everyone else's interest. Now, the common good requires that there be rulers and that they actually rule. Even in his famous and wonderful letter from the Birmingham jail in which he's, Martin Luther King is giving us an account of why he is breaking a law on this occasion, he makes the point that the gravest danger of all is anarchy. It's having no law because in circumsta circumstances of anarchy, the strong prey with impunity on the weak. So we need law. There need to be rules, and there need to be rulers who make the rules, who enforce the rules, who interpret the rules where their meaning is in dispute. And to grasp this is to begin to see the sense in which good rulers really are servants. Members of societies face a range, sometimes a vast range, of challenges and opportunities requiring various forms of coordination, including in the case of complex societies like our society, coordination to address the problems presented by the large number and the complexity of other coordination problems. Since such problems cannot, as a practical matter, be addressed and resolved by unanimity, authority, political authority, is required. That's what the justification for political authority is. Institutions will have to be created and maintained and persons will need to be installed in the offices of those institutions to make the choices and the decisions that must be made and to do the things that need to be done for the sake of protecting public health, safety, and morals, upholding the rights and dignity of individuals and families and non-governmental entities of various descriptions and advancing the overall common good. Even a scheme of traffic regulation which in our society is indispensable. Imagine how bad the situation would be if we all had cars and no traffic regulations. Well, somebody's got to make the rules. Somebody's got to decide we're going to put the stop signs here and here rather than here and here. Somebody's got to decide which streets are one way this way, which that way, which are two way, and so forth and so on. And that's a relatively simple coordination problem in a modern society like ours. And this would be true even, you notice, this need for coordination and therefore for authority to provide coordination norms, this would be true even in a society of perfect saints. You might think, oh, in a society of perfect saints, we wouldn't need any law. 
In, in fact, Madison says just about that thing in the Federalist Papers, uh, the first edition of which, as Professor Carice mentioned, we have a copy of over there and what a treat that is. But that was a point where he went astray. Because even in a society of perfect saints where no one ever sought more than his fair share from the common stock or violated the rights of others or deliberately acted in any manner that was contrary to the common good, you would still need somebody to decide stop signs here and here, not here and here, one way this way, one way that way on this street, these streets are two ways, and so forth and so on. And we haven't even got, gotten to the coordination problems that are created and need to be solved by our complex industrial and post-industrial and information age and digital age economy. But if the moral, but the moral justification for the ruler's ruling is service to the good of all. And the common good, including the goods that are served by solving coordination problems, is not an abstraction or a platonic form hovering somewhere beyond the concrete well-being that is the flourishing of the flesh and blood members of this or that political community. Phoenix, Arizona, United States of America, or Paris, or my little town in West Virginia, or whatever it is. It just is the well-being of those persons and of the families and other associations of persons, that is what Burke called the little platoons of civil society, of which we are all members. The right of legitimate rulers to rule is rooted in the duty of rulers to rule in the interests of all. Not just in the interests of their themselves, not just in the interests of their own families, not just in the interest of their own clan or kin, not just in the interest of their own party or group, but in the interests of all. In other words, the basis of the right to rule, the right of rulers to rule, is the duty to serve everybody equally. And the realities that constitute the content of service are the various elements of the common good. By doing what is for the common good and by avoiding doing anything that harms the common good, rulers fulfill their obligations to the people over whom they exercise authority, thus serving the interests of those people, their welfare, their flourishing. In a word, serving them. And so it seems to me that the common good is best conceived of as a set of conditions. Conditions for enabling members of communities to attain for themselves by their own deliberation and judgment and choice and efforts, reasonable objectives and to realize reasonably for themselves the values for the sake of which they have reason to collaborate as a community. And in that sense, the common good is facilitative. Its elements are what enable people to do things individually and in cooperation with others, the doing of which is to a considerable degree constitutive of their all-round or integral flourishing. Under favoring conditions, people can more fully and more successfully carry out reasonable projects, pursue reasonable objectives, and thus participate in human values, including some values that are inherently social in that they fulfill people in respect of their capacities for non-instrumental forms of interpersonal relationship that are indeed constitutive of their well-being. Now, this facilitative conception of the common good, which I'm defending, does not require a doctrinaire libertarianism, either in the domain of political economy or of social morality. But it clearly excludes corporatist policies that withdraw from individuals and commit to groups or larger units what private initiative or local initiative can establish, which remove from the family or the religious or civic association and commit to government what can be accomplished by non-governmental collaborative effort or shift up to higher levels of government what can be accomplished better and with more responsiveness and accountability by lower levels of government. This idea is known in the philosophical literature as subsidiarity, the idea that we should solve our problems, including our coordination problems, at the lowest level and only move up to higher levels from private to governmental, from local governmental to regional or national governmental, if it is necessary to do so in order to achieve the uh, values that we have 
good reasons to seek to achieve. At the highest level, something like national defense. We commit that quite reasonably to the national government. We don't commit to the national government seeing to it that our children's teeth are brushed in the morning. We leave that to the family and so forth. And all of this goes well beyond economics. If we understand the common good, if we grasp what constitutes or is conducive to the flourishing of human beings and what is not, we'll recognize, as the founders of our nation did, that limited government is also important because it permits the functioning and flourishing of non-governmental institutions of civil society, Burke's little platoons again, families and churches and private associations of every description, the Boy Scouts and the Campfire Girls and the Little League and on and on. Institutions that perform better than government could ever conceivably do the most essential health, education, and welfare functions and which play the primary role in transmitting to each new generation the virtues, that is the qualities of, of heart and mind, without which free societies, democratic republics, cannot survive. What are some of those values? Well, they're things like basic honesty, integrity, self-restraint, concern for others, respect for the dignity and rights of others, civic-mindedness. These non-governmental authority structures, families and churches and private associations of every description, represent another crucial way in which power is properly diffused and not concentrated in the hands of the state and its officials. You notice that Republican government, our democratic way of life, our democratic institutions depend on, and I'll argue this a bit more later, depend on people actually having some of those virtues, being honest, basically honest, not that nobody's perfect, but being basically honest, having integrity, being civic-minded, caring about others, not just about themselves, but government can't dictate those virtues or mandate those virtues. Courts of law can't impose them. You can't get a writ of mandamus to make Junior treat his sister decently. If that, those virtues are going to be inculcated in people, it's not going to be because of government edicts as much as government depends on them. It's going to be because of mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and pastor and teacher and coach and scout leader. All those little platoons, the people who actually are the substance of those little platoons of civil society. And they, in turn, the little platoons, can play their proper role in supporting a democratic republic and its institutions only when government is not unlimited but is rather limited. For unlimited government always usurps the authority and destroys the autonomy of the institutions of civil society usually recruiting or commandeering them into being state functionary organs. And you've seen this, for example, in communist societies or fascist societies, wherever they've existed. And where the institutions are playing their proper role, they help to create conditions themselves, help to create conditions, an informed and effective citizenry in which the ideal of limited government is much more likely to be realized and preserved and its benefits enjoyed by the people. So, a critical element of any discussion of the quality of democratic deliberation and decision -make making that amounts to anything more than hot air will be the indispensable role of non-governmental institutions of civil society in sustaining a culture by imparting virtues that political institutions need but cannot themselves impart. And so we must be mindful that bad behavior on the part of political institutions, behavior that undermines the virtue-forming and educating role of institutions of civil society, can weaken, enervate, and even corrupt these institutions of civil society, rendering them, for all intents and purposes, impotent to resist the bad behavior and useless, uh, the bad behavior of officials, and useless to the cause of political reform when it's needed. Now. None of what I just said, none of what I've said so far, is meant to in any way deny or undermine the importance of what you will read about if you actually get out and read, and I'd encourage everyone to do it on this Constitution Day, 
a copy of your Constitution. It is mercifully short and very readable. And if you have a little more time, you'll see that none of what I've said undermines what you will read in the Federalist Papers, those op-ed pieces written by Hamilton and Madison and Jay for New York newspapers to persuade their fellow citizens in New York to ratify the proposed Constitution. Boy, can you imagine what it must have been like to live in a time, those of you who've read the Federalist Papers, when that's what an op-ed piece looked like in a newspaper? Pretty cool, huh? Now, I, I'm making this point that I'm not denying any of that for this reason. How does our Constitution protect liberty and prevent tyranny? How did our founders, how did Hamilton and Madison and, Jay and Washington and the others, how did they propose to protect liberty and prevent tyranny? You'll notice that the Bill of Rights is a set of amendments, right? You can probably infer from the fact that it's a set of amendments that those weren't regarded as the primary ways. They're obviously about protecting liberty and preventing tyranny, but they're not the primary ways or mechanisms by which our founders sought to protect liberty and prevent tyranny. No, our founders sought to protect liberty and prevent tyranny by constraining governmental power, by limiting and checking the power of those servants who rule us by exercising authority over us. And so, for example, at the heart of our constitutional system is the distinction between a national government of delegated and enumerated and therefore limited powers, validly exercising only powers that have been delegated to it via the Constitution by the people, we the people, and state governments as governments of general jurisdiction exercising plenary authority, what in our tradition we call police powers to protect public health, safety, and morals and advance the common good. And of course, even within the national government, powers checking power. You remember this from your high school civics, I hope. The idea that we're not going to unify the government on a parliamentary model or something like that, we're actually going to have a separation of the powers of the legislature, the executive, and the judicial, with these independent grant branches of government functioning independently and in various ways limiting and checking each other to retain the sovereignty, the ultimate sovereignty of the people, and to prevent the depredations against liberty, which can be expected, no matter how virtuous we think our leaders are, can be expected in situations where power is unlimited. So in stressing the need for civic virtue and for the institutions of civil society that impart those virtues in ways that government cannot, I'm not trying to underplay the importance of structural constraints on power of our constitutional system. The American constitutional system is, in my view, on the most solid possible ground in establishing them and insisting upon them. But experience shows all too well that these structural constraints, as good as they are, as necessary as they are, will be effective only where they are effectually supported by the people, that is, by the political culture. The people need to understand them and value them, and value them enough to resist usurpations by their rulers, even when unconstitutional programs offer immediate gratifications or the relief of urgent problems. And this, in turn, requires certain virtues, strengths of character, among the people. But again, these virtues don't just fall down from the heavens. They have to be transmitted and nurtured through the generations. Madison famously said that only a well-instructed people can permanently be a free people. And that's true. But it points to the fact that even the best constitutional structures, and ours are excellent, even the strongest structural constraints on power aren't worth the paper they are printed on if people don't understand them, 
value them and have the will, the virtue, to resist the blandishments of those who come offering, and they will come, they will always come, offering something tempting in return for giving them up or letting violations of them occur without swift and certain political retaliation. Uh, I see my old friend Justice Bullock uh, here. And Clint, you will uh, remember that our friend Justice Scalia, the late Justice Antonin Scalia, used to have two constitutions in his pocket when he would travel around. He, the one, of course, was the Constitution of the United States. The other was the Constitution of the Soviet Union. And he did that not to show the inferiority of the Constitution of the Soviet Union to ours. That's not why. Clint will remember this. He would get out the Soviet Constitution. He would say, how good is this? How great is this? Look, under the Soviet Constitution, we have explicit protection for freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, right to protest, due process of law, equal protection. What a great Constitution. And then, of course, he would make the obvious point that those are just words on the page. And although words on the page are important, indeed necessary, those structural, constitutional, uh, structural constraints on power of our Constitution, I, I don't want us to touch them. I want to keep them, keep them in place. But in order for them to have substance in life, for them to be real, to function, we need to understand them as citizens. We need to value them. We need to refuse to give them up. And not just when some obvious bad guy comes and says, I'm going to take your liberty away. We need to have the strength of character, the virtue, to refuse to give them up when somebody comes and says, I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to make you happy. I'm going to protect you from your enemies. All you have to do is give up some more power to me. Let me, let me step over these, you know, these, mere, these mere words on the page, these constraints. So virtue is needed. And that's not merely a matter of improving civics teachings, uh, teaching in homes and schools, although that would be good. And all praise to the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership for the leadership and work it's doing for that end. But the Constitution of the United States was famously defended by Madison in Federalist Paper Number 51 as, and I'll quote, uh, the, the, the con law professors in the room can say this in unity, supplying by opposite and rival interests the defects of better motives. Yeah, but he made this point immediately after observing that the first task of government is to control the governed, the citizens, and the second is to control itself. He allowed that, and I quote, a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government. But experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions, unquote. Do you see those constitutional structural constraints, the separation of powers, our system of federalism, all the others, our Bill of Rights, those are not the primary mechanisms for the defense of liberty and the prevention of tyranny. They are necessary, but necessary as what? Auxiliary precautions. There's primary and there's secondary. There's primary and there's auxiliary. Primary and educated and virtuous people a people capable of self-government, capable of self-restraint, capable of self-control, jealous in the protection of their liberties, won't hand them over to a demagogue, caring for each other and the rights of each other, arguing about it, differences of opinion, even about big questions, but respectful of the principles and institutions of Republican government. Those structural constitutional constraints, structural constraints on power, very, very necessary, but not primary. Auxiliary. What's also necessary, of course, 
is a vibrant, healthy political culture, what Madison refers to as a dependence on the people to keep the rulers in line. But that brings us right back to the crucial importance of virtue. John Adams understood as well as anyone the general theory of the Constitution. I'm now gonna say something really controversial. Adams was the ablest scholar and political theorist of the founding generation. Now people should be throwing things at me and say, no, it was Jefferson or it was, okay. no, no, Adams, <laughs> you might know the story, it's actually a true story. Um, uh, the original thought was for Adams to chair the committee to write the Declaration of Independence and for Adams to take the pen and be the guy who wrote the, the Declaration. Adams himself turned it over to Jefferson. So we all know Jefferson was the guy who actually was in charge and the principal draftsman of the, of the Declaration. Why did Adams do that? Adams did that because he wanted the project to succeed. And as he said to Jefferson, you, sir, are tall and likable. I am short and obnoxious. <laughs> and you are 10 times the writer I will ever be. Now, all of that was true, <laughs> but he was, even by comparison with Jefferson, the ablest scholar and political theorist of the founding. And he certainly got the point, did Mr. Adams, about supplying the defect of better motives. He understood that. Yet he also understood that the health of political culture was an indispensable element of the success of the constitutional enterprise, an enterprise of ensuring that the rulers would stay within the bounds of their legitimate authority and indeed be servants of the common good, servants of the people they rule. And so he remarked that, quote, our constitution is made for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. What's he saying there? That's pretty powerful, right? He's saying that the Constitution is not an engine that will go of itself. It presupposes a certain kind of virtue in the people, a certain kind of people. That's why you just can't drop down our wonderful Constitution on anybody anywhere and assume it's going to work. There's a kind of cultural set of presuppositions that have to be in place if it's to work. And that's because a people lacking in virtue really can be counted on, sooner or later, to trade liberty for protection or for financial security in a terrible depression or something like that, or for comfort, or for being looked after, or for being taken care of, or having their problems solved quickly. And we're all flesh and blood human. Read Federalist 10 about how bad we are. <laughs> uh, they, they, um, the, the, the founders were realists about human nature. You know, they, they know our weaknesses, how given we are to temptation and selfishness of various sorts and the love of comfort and ease and having somebody else do uh, stuff for us that we should be doing for ourselves and, and so forth. And they also knew that there will always be people occupying or standard, standing for public office who will be very happy to take advantage of that weakness in our human nature and offer us the deal, an expansion of their power in return for what they can offer us by virtue of that expansion. Just give me more power, I'll make you rich, I'll make you happy, I'll make you comfortable, I'll make you safe. So the question then is how to form people fitted out with the virtues, making them worthy of freedom and capable of preserving constitutionally limited government, even in the face of strong temptations, which will inevitably come to compromise it away. And here we see the central political role and significance of those basic institutions of civil society, those little platoons, the family, the religious community, private associations of every description, that are devoted to the inculcation of knowledge and virtue, private educational institutions as well as public ones, institutions that are in the business of transmitting not only information and intellectual skills, but essential virtues. 
These are indeed, as has often been said, these institutions of civil society, mediating institutions that provide a buffer between the individual and the power of the central state. The, the role of uh, institutions of civil society in mediating is an important um, theme of the work of the great Harvard uh, legal scholar, Marianne Glendon. These are indeed mediating institutions, and it's ultimately the autonomy and integrity and general flourishing of them that will determine the fate of limited constitutional government. If you, if you want to ask your question, if you want to ask the question, if constitutional government does fail, what will cause it to fail? If our republic eventually goes the way of all past republics, what will cause it to go that way? Not only failing, but collapsing into the worst forms of tyranny. That's the historical record of republican government, governments. That's what the founders were worried about in trying to design a new system that would enable republican government to long endure, as Lincoln would later, later put it. I, I would uh, guess, my, my money would be on the failure, the enervation, the undermining of the autonomy and authority of institutions of civil society. Uh, uh, an undermining that government itself will have played a very significant role in uh, making happen. So we have a big stake. We and our prosperity, uh, prosperity, we, we and our posterity have a big stake. Your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, in the flourishing of the institutions of civil society if we want to keep this republic. And this is not only because of their primary and indispensable role in transmitting virtues, it's also because of their performance of basic health, education, and welfare functions. Getting the kids' teeth brushed in the morning, getting them up, getting them to school, getting them fed, looking at their report cards. You don't want a government office checking the kids' report cards. That's for mom and dad. But where the institutions of civil society fail, the only alternative, the only real alternative, will be the removal of their functions to larger and higher associations, to government. And when government expands to play the primary role in performing those functions because they pushed the institutions of civil society out of the way or the institutions of civil society have failed and government has no choice but to come in, government's going to grow and it's going to expand into more and more areas of life. It will perform the functions that should be performed by families and churches and civic associations of every sort. And the ideal of limited government, of course, will be lost. The government will do those jobs because it has to. It'll do it poorly, do them poorly, but it will do them. And the corresponding weakening of the status and authority of the institutions of civil society, the damaging of those institutions, will mean that the pedagogical functions that they serve will also be damaged. So we will not be a well-instructed people. We will not be a well-informed and effective citizenry. And with that, our institutions surely lose their capacity to influence for the good the political culture, which at the end of the day is the whole shooting match when it comes to whether our rulers really will be servants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I want to take just a couple of minutes uh, before I ask you a, a first question to give a bit of a backstory. So Robbie mentioned that this little department at Arizona State University has, has um, become something of a model. Uh, there, are now, there are now six other states that have this model of a department blending liberal arts education and civic education funded by state government at a public university. Uh, but I want to say that in 2016, this had not been done in anybody's memory. Um, and before I was ever contacted to be a, the department head, 
uh, the name, the James Madison program at Princeton University came up. I discovered later. Uh, the, the dean who was asked to build this first apartment, asking around what, what models could, we, could Arizona State University possibly have for establishing this kind of a, an educational program at the higher education level. And the name that came up more often than other is, you ought to look at what the James Madison program does. It's not a department, but the model it gave of offering courses, but also a speaker's program and trying to blend education in institutional knowledge with these civic virtues. Mm -hmm. Second thing is that Robbie and his good friend Cornell West came in the very first year of our department, it was the year 2017, 2018. They make, traveled all the way across the country to do a speaker event, the two of them. Wonderful time. And it was a wonderful speaker event. They've done it in many places, but they made the time to come and, and speak for us. And the third thing is, since Robbie's mentioned pocket constitutions, I knew, has, having been a fellow at the James Madison program way back in the day, um, that the James Madison program had a pocket constitution and an innovation to it. Great respect for the Declaration, for the Constitution as amended, but then adding Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to it, right? bringing it into the 19th century. And, and, but I also knew from Robbie that he had great admiration for Martin Luther King Jr. And so I thought, when we did it out here in Arizona, we should add, from 1863 Gettysburg Address, we should add 1963 the I Have a Dream Address from Martin Luther King. So we have our pocket constitution. So all that by way of saying thank you. Thank you for your model. There's one other part of it. It's kind of a crazy idea to be asked to be a department head building something from scratch. And I thought to myself, that's crazy. Why would I want to do that? And then I thought, Wait a minute, it was crazy for Robbie to build the James <laughs> Madison program at Princeton, right? 20, how many years uh, now? 23 years. It was founded on July 4th of the millennial year 2000. And it has grown to be this nationally yeah. influential institution from nothing. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I have a model that I can look to. So that's my long-winded way of saying thank you. Um, well, I, I should uh, just uh, point out, I'm glad that you uh, reminded me because uh, Brother West, Cornell West, asked me to send his warm regards to all his friends out here. He remembers very well uh, that wonderful visit uh, that we had. Uh, he would uh, love to come back. We'd love to do it again together. He's busy at the moment. He has uh, uh, something else he's uh, up to, as you probably, probably know. Uh, but uh, when his terms of office are over, he would be very pleased to come back and uh, do it again. We had a wonderful time. After you've served in a presidential administration, right? As well, you know, people ask me, am I going to be uh, Professor West or President West's uh, uh, vice presidential nominee? And I have to inform them that, uh, that no, uh, what I've agreed to be is Secretary of Love in the West administration. So I'll be You heard, it, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. so on the theme of civic virtue, I want to ask, is a metaphor that reduces the gravity of all this, but it's the metaphor that we're familiar with in our day and age, software and hardware, right? The, the institutional hardware requires the civic virtues software. And I, so the first one that I wanna ask you about is one that you and Cornell West exemplify, the Madison program exemplifies. You mentioned it in your remarks. Civil disagreement. So many contentious questions of political life at every level. And the fact that we have so many levels of government from, from national, federal, state, and local. Yeah. So could you speak a little bit about how important that, what should the civil institutions of society, the little platoons, what should they be educating yeah. in everyday life through thought and, and action? And isn't civil disagreement one that they should be trying to model and trying to practice? Well, there can be no question about that. That's certainly uh, true. I hadn't heard before your software-hardware uh, analogy. It's really quite good. I mean, all analogies li limp, uh, but that one is, is pretty good. The Constitution is the, is the hardware, but you do need the software, right? A computer without software is just a piece of metal sitting, sitting there and in silicon and stuff. Um, the great challenge, of course, to republics historically, as, as Madison points out in Federalist Number 10, is faction, uh, polarization, uh, tribalism. And again, that's human nature, isn't it? Uh, we are naturally tribal creatures. Uh, we, we form 
groups and, and communities, and they're always, they're always insiders and outsiders. There's our team and the other team. There's our family, our clan, our group, our tribe, our religion, our political party, and, and, and so forth. And it's so easy for us frail, fallible, fallen human beings to fall into the trap, and it really is a trap. And here again, I, I want to praise Professor Rawls. It's so easy to fall into the trap of supposing that anybody who disagrees with me must have a bad motive, must be a bad person. It's really hard for us to truly acknowledge, more than notionally, I mean existentially, really acknowledge in our hearts that we're fallible, we could be wrong, the other guy could be right or partially right and we're partially wrong. Things are hard. Even the stuff we really deep, deeply care about, our deepest, most cherished, even our identity forming beliefs could be wrong. And even if they're not, it's still possible for reasonable people of goodwill to fail to see what we have, perhaps with great effort, attained, understood. We know from history, some of the greatest, all of the greatest figures in history had flaws. The people we most admire had imperfections, some fairly serious imperfections. But it's hard for us to acknowledge that because there's another feature of human nature. And that is we tend not only to be tribal, but to wrap our emotions more or less tightly around our convictions. That's what I mean by identity forming beliefs. Now, just in itself, that's not a bad thing. In fact, just in itself, as long as it's under control, it's a good thing. If we didn't have some emotional investment in our beliefs, we wouldn't get anything done, not just like serving big causes, but even getting the kids up and in school and fed and off and, and so forth. You need to not just believe something would be a good thing to do, you need to have some emotional oomph behind it in order to get it done. But if we wrap our emotions too tightly around our convictions, which we frail, fallible human beings are all too prone to do, we become what? Dogmatists, ideologues. And when we're in that mode and up on our high horses, we think those Democrats or those Republicans or those Catholics or those Protestants or those Christians or those atheists or those Northerners or those, you know, whoever it is, we think they're bad people. They're either bigots or fools or frauds or tools of nefarious interests, uh, and, and, and they're just not to be treated with any kind of decency or respect. Um, we barely got through the 1800 election with this republic in place. People think of the Civil War, and they rightly think of the Civil War as the great test of uh, the uh, durability of the American uh, Republic and its institutions. We had a big test before that in 1800 the viciousness of the campaign of 1800. This was between John Adams and Franklin, uh, and uh, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Aaron Burr was in the picture as well, of course, as you probably know. Uh, but I mean, the bitterness between the so-called Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, the H Hamilton and Adams party on the one hand and, and uh, Jefferson's uh, and Madison's party on the other, these were just bitter. Uh, there was hatred and animosity. There was a real question about whether, this was, this was an untried experiment, there's a real question about whether if the Federalists lost, they would give up power. Maybe they wouldn't. It was, you know, it was a real test, especially given the bitterness and divisiveness of the, of the time. You mean peaceful transfer of power has been, a, is that a, a Yeah, is that, isn't it amazing, right, how rare that is in, in, in human history? And it wasn't clear that it was gonna happen. Um, and thank God it, it did. Um, but, you know, we have been here before and we've gotten through it, which is not a guarantee that we'll get through it again. And if we are going to get through it again, we had it in 1800, we had it in 1861, uh, and in the run up to 1861, if we're going to get through it again, it's going to mean that we, the people, are going to have to learn the virtues that enable us civilly to engage our fellow citizens who have differences of opinion with us on profound and important questions. We're gonna to have to get it through our heads that, you know what, even about the stuff we really care about, we could be wrong. I mean, assume I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, if, if anybody in the audience is infallible, just tell me. Is anybody infallible? <laughs> right. 
I keep wondering when I ask that question, Pope Francis is going to walk in. And say, but uh, uh, no, nobody is, is infallible. And we all know, don't we? Again, correct me if I'm wrong. I'll well, just ask the question, does anybody out there now, uh, is anybody out there who has only true beliefs in his or her head right now and no false beliefs? Anybody whose head is, only has true beliefs? No. We know that some of the beliefs we have are false. And if I ask the question, is there anybody out there who has only true beliefs about big important things? There's no false beliefs about anything big or important. You're, and, and of course, you're going to realize, no. I mean, we all have false beliefs in our heads, and some of those undoubtedly pertain to big important things. So if, if I ask you then, well, Professor, if I ask you, well, why are you holding false beliefs in your head? That's dumb. I mean, just get rid of them, right? I mean, why are you going around having false beliefs in your head? Why don't you swap them out for true beliefs? What's your answer going to be? You're going to say, Professor George, I don't know which ones are the true ones and which ones are the false ones. But let me tell you something. You'll never know which ones are the true ones and which ones are the false ones if you shut down the speech of somebody who wants to challenge you or even short of shutting it down, if you refuse to engage in a yes. serious, open-minded way with someone who's challenging you. If you be, allow yourself to wrap your emotions so tightly around your convictions that you become a dogmatist and an ideologue, then you will be constantly affirmed, your, your, your beliefs will constantly be confirmed. You will be confirmed in those beliefs that happen to be true, but you'll also be confirmed in those beliefs that happen to be false. We need a sense of intellectual humility in this country if this democratic republic is going to work. We need that because that's the only way we'll be open to treating each other as fellow citizens who disagree and not as enemies to be destroyed. So I mentioned, yeah. I have time for just one more question and then we'll, we'll turn to the audience. But um, I mentioned that we have a video archive. So you can find that session Cornell West, Professor George, here in 2018, I think it was. And for those of you who don't know who the two of them are, right, they do not agree <laughs> on very important to each of them, but important to the country as well. Well, the way Poli I explain that is... Political, moral uh, questions. And there they are sharing a stage with each other, respecting ex each other enough to share a stage. Right? I explain. Our, uh, th this will show you how we disagree. So Cornell West is honorary chairman of Democratic Socialists of America. I am not honorary chairman of Democratic <laughs> Socialism. To put it mildly. Yeah. Uh, final question for you. Um, I'm going to pull out a second pocket constitution, and it's not the Soviet. It's not the Soviet. Yeah. It's the Arizona pocket constitution, oh, there you go. Our, our, principle of, so just, uh, our principle of federalism. But I do want to ask about another civic virtue of patriotism, which is hard for us professors or academics to talk about because we think it's not well, we maybe think it's too emotional or it's, it's, not, it's not academic, but we are coming up to America at 250, so to speak, right? Yeah, that's right. 250 years from 1776 is 2026. So I, I want to pose the paradox of our kind of patriotism. Of course, this comes from Tocqueville, right? That the Americans have a rational or reflective patriotism. They understand they're not supposed to worship the government or, or um, have the old world kind of patriotism that's only emotional, about blood and soil or the king or something like that. The Americans, he says, they want to argue. They want to argue with the government, they want to argue with each other, right? But they're grateful for this form of government that protects their liberties and equal liberties that gives them the freedom to argue. So just if you would, is that a civic virtue we should think about 250 years after, after 1776. Absolutely should, and that's because that is patriotism rightly understood. Uh, and you're right here to mention Tocqueville because he noticed that difference between our society that he visited originally to look at our prisons, and then he got fascinated with democracy in America and his own uh, society. Tocqueville was a French aristocrat. He, his wonderful chateau is still in the Tocqueville uh, uh, family. I believe it's in Normandy. Uh, it's in France. Um, yeah. Uh, I think what, what true patriotism, at least in the context of a democratic republic, is, is a rational piety. It's a love of the country for two related reasons, both of which go beyond loving it because it's mine. 
Uh, reason one is that its principles and ideals are noble and good. However much we have failed, and Lord knows we have failed historically and today, to live up to those principles, but we have never once been ashamed of ourselves when we have lived up to those principles. We've always been ashamed of ourselves when we've failed to live up to the principles. What that tells you is the problem is not the principles. The problem is in us when we fail to live up to the principles. So we shouldn't be throwing our principles overboard. We should be striving to live up to them. The second reason is this. We all benefit immensely in a huge variety of ways in virtue of living in a free state. I don't mean a state of Arizona. I mean the free, although Arizona is a free state, that's good. But in, in a, under a Republican government where our liberties are respected. Now, you know, we, there, we can argue about which liberties in controversial cases should and shouldn't be respected. Uh, and there are debates between people who are the more libertarian oriented and the people who are more social democratically oriented and all that. And that's fine, those are very perfectly legitimate debates. But everyone across the spectrum should be grateful, and this is what I mean by rational piety, be grateful for the benefits that we get in living in these circumstances of freedom. Um, I'm always reinforced in this when I talk, as I very frequently do, to people who are refugees from other sorts of regimes. Paul kindly mentioned that I served for four years on the US Commission on uh, International Religious Freedom and a couple of terms as its chairman. And in that capacity, I was talking all the time with um, uh, what we call diaspora groups and their leaders. And these were mostly people who were refugees from terrible regimes, regimes that did not have liberty. And those conversations really made me appreciate the United States of America. Not only its ideals, that's, that's number one, its principles and ideals, but the practical benefits that I as a citizen have. If you look at world history, and if, even if you look at the world today where 75% of the world does not live, the population of the world does not live in circumstances of freedom. If you were born in the United States of America, even if you were born poor, you hit the lottery. You are not living in Tibet. You are not living in North Korea. You are not living in Vietnam. You are not living in Somalia. You are not living in the Sudan. You're not living in Cuba or Venezuela. It's, it's, a, it's a real blessing. Um, I'd love to build back up the concept of American exceptionalism. It's a much misunderstood concept. It's, people on the left have often been suspicious of it because they've interpreted, as mean, interpreted it as meaning a kind of chest thumping, we're better than other people sort of thing. And of course, it's, that's, it's not what it means. And now it's not just people on the left, but even people on the right who have turned against <laughs> the concept of American exceptionalism. And uh, there, there aren't that many of us these days who, who are wanting to put up the fight for it, but I think it's really worth putting up a fight for. What does it mean? It means this. Unlike old Europe, for example, where national unity and the sense of national identity was built around blood and soil or throne and altar, a common ethnicity or race, a common religion, a common culture and cultural history. American unity and identity is built not on any of those things because we're all sorts of different races, countless ethnicities, many different religions. So we can't build our unity or integrate ourselves as a community around that stuff. I'm not saying it's always wrong to do it. I'm not condemning old Europe. We can't, it's just not an option. But we can and we have, and we can even better integrate ourselves around a shared commitment to the principles of the Declaration and the principles and the institutions of the Constitution, which really try to effectuate the principles of the, of the Declaration. Whether we're Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu or unbelievable, whatever we are, whether we're black, white, whatever our race, 
whether we're of Croatian background, Ghanan background, uh, Korean background, whatever, wherever our ancestors come from, whatever the cultural history, we can unite around our shared commitment to holding these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, somebody might look at that. Some folks on the right these days do look at that. And they say, too thin. That's too thin a basis, too thin a foundation for American unity. I look at that and I say, that's not too thin at all. I mean, most, for most of human history, people have had no conception of the idea that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. No conception of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. There's a common creed, a rich creed. I think you can build national unity on that. We have in the past. We can do it in the future. We can do it better. End of sermon. <laughs> We have some time for questions. We have a microphone in the center aisle. Um, I ask that you be brief. I ask that you actually pose a question. And I also ask that you pose a question about the topic tonight. <laughs> so if you would do those three things. OK, first question. Can you? OK, there we go. Um, so uh, George Washington famously said in his farewell address, uh, he warned against um, uh, the issues, the, issue, the issues that can be caused by political, by, uh, political alliances, yeah. Um, so my question is, and, we, and like you said with the election of 1800, it showed this. So my question is, is there a way people can become less entrenched with partisanship, not necessarily giving up their values? Well, it's a but warning about factions and parties yes, in the yeah, federal yeah. letters. Okay, yeah. Yeah. How oh, would we oh, yeah. become less in Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wrapped up um, I, I yield to no one in my admiration for George Washington. He truly was the indispensable man that we would not have Republican government, not only here, anywhere in the world today, if it weren't for George, George Washington. You can't, the, the, you can't praise Washington enough. Did he have his flaws? He's human, yeah. right? Do you live at a certain time where people have beliefs different from our beliefs? Absolutely. Uh, but it was a, a, just a, a figure astride uh, history, and it's just amazing that he was where he needed to be when he needed uh, to be there. Having said all, all that, I think that Washington was unrealistic in supposing that we could avoid political partisanship and political parties. Um, remember in the beginning of my uh, conversation with Professor Carice up here, I, I mentioned our natural human tendency toward tribalism. That just is. We're, we're going to form factions. We're going to form tribes. And that's why our constitutional system uh, is designed in the way it does to, to not try to wipe out the cause of factionalism by changing human nature. Uh, every experiment, whether it's Marx's or Hitler's, to change human nature doesn't change human nature. Human nature is going to remain the same. Uh, but rather to deal with the, the effects, to ameliorate the, uh, the, the, reflect, the, the effects. So uh, uh, Washington foresaw, because he was, real, he was a realist, he, he foresaw that you know, this will be a problem of factionalization and partisanship. I think he was, uh, gosh, I hate saying this about George Washington. Uh, I mean, I am, I am not, I, to put myself in the position of standing in judgment over George Washington is laughable. But I have to say that he, he was somewhat naive in supposing that we would not have political parties. And of course, the parties emerged immediately, immediately, you know, within his own cabinet, right? He's got Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury and his nemesis Jefferson as, as Secretary of State. And also, Washington himself, and this is not, criticism, Paul. Washington himself was alert to partisan considerations. Not, I'm saying that not in a negative sense, and here's my evidence for it. In appointing judges, he appointed, he was really careful to um, appoint a diverse set of judges, you know, from, from north as well as south and from the center of the, uh, you know, the center of the east coast as well, as midway down the country. Uh, he was careful to appoint actually people of different uh, religious uh, sects and uh, traditions. Um, but every single judge he appointed was a member of the Federalist Party. He, only appointed, he didn't trust the Jeffersonians when it came to the appointment of judges. So he had a, he, there, was, there was a kind of political sense that Washington had there. I mean, it, it would be wrong to say Washington was a Federalist. 
but I think it would be right to say Washington trusted the Federalists <laughs> with power a bit more than he trusted the Jeffersonians with, with power. The, the other uh, warning, of course, was entangling alliances, foreign alliances, and of course, this, is, this has just been a problem for our nation from the beginning, and, and there's no, as far as I can tell, there's no good solution uh, to this problem because we cannot be isolationist, but uh, there are very good reasons for not being isolationist, and Washington himself wasn't isolationist. But gosh, there's just a constant temptation to get, your, get our country into disputes abroad that are, in, in the end, end up being very damaging uh, uh, to us. Statesmanship is knowing when to go and when not to go, and, and there's no formula for that. There's no science to that. It really is, it really is an art. And in his own day, you know, Washington knew that getting involved one way or another in the disputes, in the bitterness, in the uh, animosity between England and France was going to be deadly to this country. And you know, he knew that the Federalists in general leaned in the English direction, and the Jeffersonians certainly leaned in the, in the French direction. And I think he was right uh, to say, we got to keep out of that. Good question. Next question. Hello. Uh, hi, there. hi, thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Um, I feel like in my generation, there are trends of a more secular, secular and isolated world, um, isolated in the fact that there's less value on community institutions, but also physical separations, like the increase of working from home. And I'm oh, not trying yeah. to put value judgments on either the secularism or the work from home, but I am wondering how we can rebuild or create new types of institutions in the current times. That would build community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I think there are two dimensions of the, if I've, if I've understood you correctly, and if I've not, just make me come back. Uh, the, the first dimension had to do with uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, the loss, indeed, collapse of trust in institutions. Um, and, and that's true. I mean, all the data, all the survey data, all the work of the, of the methodologists, the political scientists who, who use uh, quantitative measure and so forth, all the research points in the same direction, and that is the, the near collapse, I guess it would be best to say, of trust in institutions. And all I can say is that institutions are run by people, and people have all the flaws and foibles and problems of being human. Um, and this much we can say, um, in the case of most of the institutions in which people have lost trust, the people running the institutions have done an awful lot to earn it. <laughs> there are reasons that people distrust. It's not the problem with the people. It's the problem of the people who run the institutions, letting the side down, corruption, dishonesty, partisanship, um, you know, and, and people see that and they get disgusted by it and they lose faith in, in institutions. Um, you're right that we need to rebuild community and of course the, the pandemic didn't help there and you know, we could argue about the policies of the, of the pandemic, but whether they were justified or unjustified, the isolation of people undermined uh, uh, community and community formation in ways that are gonna, that are gonna ramify. Uh, we're gonna be years living with consequences, uh, I think, of the pandemic and the policies that, depending on your point of view, it necessitated or shouldn't have been uh, enacted or should have been, should have been different. Um, one of those, I mean, one, one and then I don't want to just single this one out, but to me it's, it's just kind of interesting, is the decline in church attendance. And going all the way back to Tocqueville, uh, Americans, Tocqueville noticed, uh, Americans build community in their houses of, of worship. And one of the most remarkable things about this country is the way that people of different faiths are able to join together as fellow citizens, even though they're in different places on the, the Saturdays and Sunday. Um, you, you, can, you can have, our political parties are not organized along religious lines. You know, the, the Democrats have Catholics and Republicans, uh, Catholics and Protestants, and the Republicans have Catholics and, and, and Protestants and, and so forth. Um, but our political system, our political institutions do depend on uh, virtues that, that get imparted in the context of communities. And I would put religious communities in the forefront there. So it's a problem for our civic life 
if there is a loss of community at the ecclesial level. I think we're, we're you know, if, if people are isolated in part because they're just not getting together for religious worship, no matter how religious they are at the, in, within their own individual homes and their isolated uh, lives, long term that would be a problem. So I think um, people in all domains of um, uh, civil society, pastors, coaches, uh, people who are already able and willing to uh, lead campfire girls and scout troops and do little league and all that stuff, need to push really hard to rebuild those institutions. It's those institutions that have been damaged and we need to get them up and running again. It may seem pretty remote from big political decisions, whether there's a little league game going on, but a lot of the virtues that we need in people, people learn in things like Little League. That, that's the magic of the system, where they learn them in church on Sunday, they learn them in the campfire girls or in the, in the 4-H or, or what have you. So we've all got a stake in the, in the functioning of civil society. We can't just say, well, as long as the constitutional institutions are, are fine, we're okay. Our founders understood that that wasn't enough. That, that's that point about auxiliary and primary. <laughs> You know, the real work of virtue formation is not done by political institutions. It's done by institutions of civil society, the communities, the little platoons. Thank you. I, I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> I'm sorry, we <clears throat> only got time for two uh, questions. I'm going to ask that each of you briefly state a question to the, these last two, and we'll see if Robbie can try and handle two at once. Oh, okay. So just oh, briefly, two, two last points. To, to say it briefly, uh, okay, so. Our whole tradition and the Constitution is based upon freedom of expression, freedom, freedom of the press, and the press has gone totally to the left now. So is there any way to get the press back so the, the, these two last elections, the 20 and 22 elections, did not turn out to be a one-time, one-vote Venezuela kind of thing? Okay, freedom of the press. Okay, right. and then a last question. Hi. How does a country or society restore civic virtue without imposing or mandating different personal values on others? Yeah, okay. So first, the freedom of the press. Um, the idea of a nonpartisan, impartial uh, press is actually a fairly new one. <laughs> uh, those of us who grew up in the post-World War II uh, generations, if, you're, if your dad or your granddad was in World War II, you probably think of the norm of the ideal as a nonpartisan press. I mean, reporters who get just the facts and don't, uh, don't allow uh, personal opinions to, uh, to infect uh, the facts. But uh, at earlier points in our uh, uh, history, in the history of the Republic, the newspapers were straightforwardly, unambig and unambiguously, and unapologetically partisan. So if you really wanted to get at the facts, you would read the papers from both sides, and uh, you would believe what they said about the other side, but not what they said about themselves <laughs> or their own, their own side. Um, this was even true during the coverage, of course, of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858. Um, so uh, we, of course, don't have transcripts of the debates, but we have something pretty close to transcripts of the debates from the newspaper reports at the time. But it turns out that the Republican papers would edit Lincoln's remarks to improve at least their flow and diction and so forth. And the Democrat papers would edit uh, Douglass's uh, remarks. So if you want to know what they actually said, believe the Republican papers <laughs> on Douglas and the Democratic papers on, on Lincoln. And there is actually an, an edition of the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates out that, that has that, that did it, did it exactly that way. Um, one nice thing about the age that we live in is that nobody is stuck with ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. You can go on the internet and you can read all sorts of stuff, I mean, from all sorts of different perspectives. Now, I kind of would like uh, to have at least some in the mix, some nonpartisan 
uh, uh, perspectives. Um, the best we can do there that I can think of is the aggregators, like Real Clear Politics, which I think does a good job of, you, you, I wake up in the morning, I go to Real Clear Politics, and I see what looks to me like a selection on a nonpartisan basis of what somebody at Real Clear Politics thinks are the best, most interesting um, op-ed pieces and speeches and things like that coming from the Democrats and the Republicans and the right and the left. So I think that's the best we can do, at least the best we are doing uh, right now. If some aspiring journalists out there uh, want to uh, build institutions that, that really will provide nonpartisan uh, perspectives on the news, I'm all for that. I'm not, I'm not denying that that would be a good thing. Um, we, don't have a, we don't have much of a history of that, even when our news media purported to be nonpartisan, that post-World War II generation thing. I mean, the truth is they were pretty partisan. Uh, so. You now we do the best we can. Um, on uh, the second question about rebuilding um, society without imposing, of course, here we get into the big questions of uh, political uh, morality and the common good. Um, what counts as the imposition of your values on somebody else as opposed to what counts as putting into place laws and policies that advance uh, the common good? Um, Somebody might say, well, you know, to, to stop somebody from engaging in the practice of prostitution is violating their basic liberty. Uh, other, other people are going to say, no, that's actually for the, you know, that's actually serving the common good. Prostitution is damaging not only the people who are involved in it morally, but also to the society as a whole. Uh, then there are people on the other side that say, you know, the, you, you want real violations of liberty, rent control laws. Rent control laws are real violations of people's liberties. And by the way, not just rent control laws, but all these government regulations that, uh, that impose on uh, the business owner and even civil rights laws. These civil rights laws tell people who they can and can't serve, and that's imposing on, on their liberties. Now, your perspective on that is going to be shaped by your broader understanding of political morality and indeed of, of morality itself. Uh, if you're a certain kind of person, it's just gonna be obvious to you that of course people should have the right uh, to uh, uh, have prostitution if they, or be involved in prostitution if they want, but they certainly shouldn't have the right to be free of rent control. From another political, if, you're, if your view is shaped from the other side, they're gonna say, well, obviously people shouldn't be allowed to engage in prostitution, uh, uh, but uh, they, they sh there, there shouldn't be rent control uh, laws. So before anybody gets up and makes a big speech about um, the imposition on liberty, I think they should examine their own presuppositions and identify what perspective they're coming from and see if they can actually defend with good reasons and evidence and argument the perspective that they hold that's going to be shaping their idea of what does count as policies that are for the common good and what do really count and should really count as violations of people's personal liberty. It's not nearly as easy as some people uh, on both sides of the political spectrum think it is. Well, thank you. And uh, with that, I have a few closing remarks before we, we thank Professor George. <clears throat> so the first thing is for all the students here or anyone who cares about students, please to try and get some information on the way out, table in the room, table outside, to learn more about the school, this blend of civic education and liberal arts education, our, our degree programs, a PPE certificate that we have, a master's degree that we have, and you can also get an Arizona and a U.S. pocket constitution as, as well. Uh, second, to let everyone know that our next event is already scheduled October 11th, we have Richard Haas, who recently stepped oh. down as the longtime president of the Council on Foreign Relations, but he's not here to talk about foreign policy. He's here to talk about his new great passion civics and civic education. He's just written a book, get this title, Robbie, The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens. That is his new book, and he's here to talk about that October 11th. Please join us for that and, and spread the word. You can get more information on our website. Um, if uh, you would join me in a final round of applause, not only for Robbie, but for the team that puts oh, on the these team, kinds yeah. of events, the mm -hmm. Civic Discourse mm -hmm. Project. Uh, I'll just mention, a few, uh, just mention a few names. Our new associate director in the school, professor in the school, Will Hay, the associate director for public programs. 
uh, Janelle Lasieff, who is our events coordinator, Paul Willett, our communications manager, the rest of the team, student workers, uh, make all of this possible. Special thanks, as I mentioned, to the Hayden Library staff who helped us bring the Federalist uh, here and for the ASU police officer who's here to, to help us uh, keep that safe. I want to mention also Dylan Delzato and Sean Beinberg, staff and faculty member in the school who've been over there sitting with the Federalist uh, all evening. Please look for our podcast, which you can find um, on our website. It's called Keeping It Civil. Uh, interviews with our speakers in the Civic Discourse Project, and eventually we'll have an interview with Robbie uh, on that. And um, finally, please do stay for a bit. Uh, we have a reception. You can see the Federalist Papers. As I mentioned, we look forward to see you on October 11th at our next event. And with that, one last thanks to Professor Robert George. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.